Hey, this lecture is an immediate follow-up to the preceding lecture where at the end of that lecture I did a simple demonstration involving myself standing on a skateboard. In that demonstration I'm using the skateboard to mimic a horizontal frictionless surface and so then therefore the sum of the external forces acting on myself and the skateboard as a whole, that is the system, is equal to zero. This then means that the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to zero, so then therefore the velocity of the center of mass is a constant. But I'm just standing there to begin with, so the velocity of my center of mass is equal to zero, and it's equal to zero the whole time. So as I shift back and forth on the skateboard, as I do in that demonstration, the position of my center of mass relative to the ground never moves. Now normally I follow up that demonstration with a second demonstration involving a second person also standing on a skateboard, a student for example, and we hold a pole between us. And then we shift back and forth on our skateboards like so by means of the pole. Once again, the basic physics, however, is the same. That is, the sum of the external forces acting on the system as a whole is at zero. Therefore, the acceleration of the center of mass is at zero. Therefore, the velocity of the center of mass is a constant. And because we are standing there to begin with, the velocity of the center of mass is zero, and it's zero the whole time. So the position of the center of mass of that system as we shift back and forth on our skateboards never moves relative to the ground. I also conclude that demonstration by having myself and the other student collide together, and when we do, we collide at the center of mass. So I'm gonna do an immediate problem that alludes to that demonstration. I hope to be able to film that demonstration at a later date, but that, of course, depends upon the current pandemic. At any rate, however, we have the following problem. Immediately copy it down into your notes as I read it to you here. Okay, so two people of masses 50 and 75 kilograms respectively are standing 10 meters apart on a horizontal frictionless surface. The two people are holding onto a pole of negligible mass, so we'll ignore the mass of the pole. The more massive person pulls on the pole such that he moves one meter to the left relative to the origin. Therefore, where does the other person end up relative to the origin? That is, how far does the other person move? Then we'll follow it up by ultimately calculating out where the two people do in fact collide. As I mentioned, they do collide at the center of mass, but we'll have to show that here in the example. Okay, now here's the basic physics of the example. The sum of the external forces acting on the system is equal to zero. It's a horizontal frictionless surface. Therefore, the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to zero. This is a one-dimensional problem, so I'll just drop the vector notation. So if the acceleration of the center of mass is zero, therefore the velocity of the center of mass is equal to a constant. But in the demonstrations, everybody just starts out standing still to begin with, so then therefore the velocity of the center of mass is zero, and it's zero the whole time. Therefore, the position of the center of mass never moves. Therefore, the position of the center of mass is a constant. Okay, now the easiest way to draw out a situation such as this is what is already being alluded to in the example. We'll begin by placing M1, we'll call it, the 50 kilogram person at the origin, and then the more massive person, M2, we'll call it, of 75 kilograms to the right hand side. This is usually the easiest way to set up a problem such as this. Okay, so here's what it looks like before the people start moving around. All right, so right here is the lighter person. This is M1 equal to 50 kilograms. And this person is initially by definition at the origin, so that person's position X1 is zero. Here's the more massive person. M2 is 75 kilograms. This person is 10 meters to the right-hand side of the origin. We'll call that X2. That's equal to 10 meters, like so. And now before they start moving around, let's immediately calculate the position of the center of mass by using the center of mass expression. We'll do this just for point masses arranged in one dimension. So I'm going to have, first of all, m1 times x1, which is 0, and then plus m2 times x2, and then divided by the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2. Let's just immediately calculate this out and then locate it on our diagram. Okay, so the numerator is going to be 75 times 10, so 750, and then divided by a total of 125 kilograms in the denominator, and this then gives us 6 meters. So this means, of course, that the center of mass is closer to M2 than it is to M1 because M2 is the more massive person. All right, so let's say that the center of mass is about right here on my diagram like so. And then the people start moving around. What we're given in the problem is that M2 moves one meter to the left-hand side of where he was originally. The details of how long this takes, how long the people shift back and forth on their skateboards and so on, none of those details matter. 
And the reason for that is because any forces that occur in between the two people while this is going on, those are all forces that are internal to the system. And they all cancel out by Newton's third law anyway. The only thing that matters are the external forces. So then therefore, after they stop, stop moving around, draw the diagram then directly below the previous one, such that we could show, for example, once again, that the center of mass never moves. And now we're given that M2 moves one meter to the left-hand side. Let's say that that's right here. And so then therefore, the new position of this person, call it X2 prime, is given to us as nine meters. Okay, now normally when I do this demonstration, it becomes plainly obvious that when the two people pull together, M1 does in fact move to the right-hand side of the origin. So right over here somewhere is gonna be M1, and then the unknown in this problem is what we'll call X1 prime. That's the new position of M1. If it is a positive number, as I'm guessing here on this diagram, this then means that M1 moves to the right-hand side like so, as the two people begin to pull together. Okay, now we once again just set up a center of mass calculation, but now we use this diagram to do so. And we already know what the position of the center of mass is from earlier, it's six meters. All right, so XCM now equals M1X1 prime plus M2X2 prime, and then divided by the sum of the masses, M1 plus M2. And now what we solve for here is X1 prime. So let's go ahead and do the math. So the next step is going to be to cross multiply this denominator over here to the left hand side, like so. Just have enough room here to write this, like so. And now what we solve for here is x1 prime. So subtract this term here to the other side and then divide by m1 to now get x1 prime by itself. Okay, so doing those necessary mathematical steps that then gives me this, like so. And now, if in fact I am correct in guessing that M1 moves to the right-hand side, then this should ultimately work out to be a positive number. So here is a total of 125 kilograms times six meters. Okay, and then minus 75 times nine, and then all over 50 kilograms. And sure enough, it's a positive number, it's 1.5 meters. So then therefore, M1 moves 1.5 meters to the right-hand side. Okay, and then we follow up the problem here with, once again, a portion of the demonstration, where do the objects collide? It's plainly obvious when I actually do the demonstration that they collide at the center of mass, but now we have to show that explicitly. The easiest way to picture this is to, once again, draw another diagram, but then draw it immediately below the preceding diagram. So now let's do that like this. Okay, so here is once again, from earlier, the position of the center of mass like so. And now I'm going to go ahead and draw the two people collided together at the center of mass. So here is both M1 and M2 like so. Now on my diagram, I'm assuming this, but I do have to prove, in fact, that the position of the two objects is now going to be equal to the position of the center of mass. Now, even though I haven't done that yet, right here is gonna be the unknown position of the two people, I'm gonna call it X prime. It's gonna be the same value, of course, for both people because the two people have collided together. And now, like I did earlier in the problem, we once again just write down an equation for the position of the center of mass, but now we solve for this new position, X prime. Okay, so now using this last diagram down here, the position of the center of mass is going to be, first of all, m1 times x prime plus m2 times the same x prime, and then divided by the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2. Now watch what happens mathematically here in this equation if I factor out the x prime, which is common to both terms in the numerator, and you get this. So, and notice that the sum of the masses, M1 plus M2, cancels from the expression. So then therefore, X prime, the new position of the two objects, once again, it's the same because they've collided together, is in fact XCM. So then therefore, the two people do in fact collide at the center of mass, as is usually shown in the demonstration, okay? 
Okay, now in this example, we ignored the mass of the pole. I always do a follow-up to this example, which essentially obeys the exact same physics. It's just a slightly more complicated situation. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is do some erasing here. However, the basic physics of the problem that we just completed, right over here that is, this is going to apply to this follow-up problem as well, so I'm gonna leave this information here. Okay, let me move the file, and I'll go ahead and read the problem to you. Okay, and then the problem is as follows. Okay, a man of mass 80 kilograms and his date are enjoying a ride in a canoe with a mass of 30 kilograms and a length of three meters. He asks her to switch seats, which are at opposite ends of the canoe. He notices that the canoe moves 0.4 meters with respect to the shore. Hang on a moment. Point four meters with respect to the shore in doing so. Assuming that the man is more massive, calculate her mass. So it's basically the same problem as I just did, but now we have a couple of complications. We have a third object to include, and that's gonna be the canoe. And then the situation is a little bit more complicated than the one that we did in the fact that the two people have switched seats in this problem. But other than that, it's basically the same physics of the previous example. The canoe in this case is mimicking the horizontal frictionless surface. Okay, now you may be having a little bit of trouble picturing this problem, so let's immediately go ahead and draw it out. Okay, so in this case, I have three objects. We first of all have the two people. Now, it does say that the girl is going to be less massive than the guy, so then therefore we'll go ahead and put her at the origin. This is the person M1, and the mass of this person is unknown. However, I do put that person at the origin, so that person's position, X1, is at zero. Okay, and then we have the guy over here. This is M2. This person's mass is given to us as 80 kilograms. And then this person's position here relative to the origin X2, that's the length of the canoe. It's three meters. Okay, and then we have the canoe itself. How do you deal with the canoe? Well, think of the canoe as a one-dimensional stick of uniform density. And as we did in the previous example, we already know where the center of mass of that one-dimensional stick is, and it's at its geometric center. So I'm going to represent the canoe as a point mass where the mass itself is at the geometric center of the canoe. So then therefore we'll call that M3. So right here then is the canoe, M3. Okay, its mass is given to us as 30 kilograms. And then therefore if we picture that as a point at the geometric center of the canoe, let me actually go ahead and draw the canoe like this. So right here is the canoe. This then means that the position then of the canoe relative to the origin, X3 prime, or X3 rather, is 1.5 meters. That's half the length of the canoe. Okay, now let's go ahead and write down an equation for the position of the center of mass based upon this diagram. So the position of the center of mass is gonna be first of all, M1 times X1, which is zero, plus M2 times X2, plus M3 times X3, and then divided by the sum of the masses. So, notice, however, in the expression, there are two unknowns. Okay, we don't know what M1 is. That's what we're trying to find, remember, nor do we know the position of the center of mass. So this equation by itself is not enough to solve the problem. And now we are given the following information. The two people switch seats and the canoe moves 0.4 meters with respect to the shore. Which way the canoe moves depends upon which person is more massive. If M2 is more massive than M1, as is given in this problem, then the situation, as you'll see, has to look like this. Let's say it right here is M1, let's say it right here is M2, and I'm the canoe. And then the two people switch seats and M2 is greater than M1. Then the situation will look like this. If instead M1 was bigger than M2, then the canoe would shift in the opposite direction. So technically speaking, there are actually two examples within this problem, but we're just solving one of the examples where M2 is greater than M1. So let me note that here. We're given that M2 is greater than M1. Now, why must the canoe shift to the right-hand side like so when the two people switch seats? The easiest way to understand that is to, to at least qualitatively position the center of mass in this problem. So think of it like this. Even though we don't know what the position of the center of mass is, 
is that center of mass position going to be between M1 and M3 or between M3 and M2? It's going to be between M3 and M2 because we're given that M2 is greater than M1. So even though we don't know where it is yet, we'll calculate it later in the problem, right here we'll say just qualitatively is where the center of mass is. The center of mass, remember, never moves. So then therefore, after they switch seats, the situation has to look like this. The center of mass still has to be between M2 and M3. Therefore, it has to look like so. Okay, now right here is once again the center of mass. And now we have the problem. M2, M3, M1, where right here is the canoe and notice that the center of mass is still in between M2 and M3. Notice that the canoe shifted to the right-hand side. Okay, now with this diagram, we have new positions. So first of all, right here is the position of M2, call it X2 prime. This is actually what's given as 0.4 meters in the problem. We're given, remember, that the canoe shifts 0.4 meters with respect to the shore, with respect to the ground. So this distance here is actually given. Okay, and then right here is the canoe, M3. So right here is an X3 prime. That new position is equal to 0.4 meters plus 1.5 meters, which remember was half the length of the canoe. So this distance here is known, it's 1.9 meters. And then lastly, we have a new position for M1. This is X1 prime. This is gonna equal to 0.4 meters plus now the entire length of the canoe, which is 3.4 meters, like so. So once you recognize what has to happen in this example, that is the center of mass must be always in between M2 and M3, this then means that the canoe has to shift to the right-hand side. And now using this diagram, let's go ahead and write down an equation for the position of the center of mass. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna have right over here, M1 times X1 prime plus M2 times X2 prime plus M3 times X3 prime. And then we divide by the sum of the masses. Like so. And now I've got one, two equations, and two unknowns. The two unknowns are XCM and the mass M1. The easiest way to do the algebra is actually just to set the two equations equal to each other. Let's do that. Okay, so first of all, take the top expression. That's, oops, before they start moving around. Let me make sure I write this down correctly. There we go. And then we set this equal to the bottom expression after they move around. Once again, making sure I write this down correctly. And then as I'm writing this down, it initially looks like it's gonna be a horrible mess. But take a look at what happens to the denominator on both sides of the expression. Notice that it cancels, like so. And then right here is the unknown M1. So I'm now just gonna directly solve for that. Okay, so we have, first of all, these two terms here. Okay, and now to solve for M1, we subtract this term to the other side. Subtract this term to the other side. And lastly, divide by x1 prime to now get m1 by itself. Like so. And now we plug in. So, once again, if in fact the canoe shifts to the right-hand side, this then means that m1 should be less than m2. Let's see what happens. All right, so let's go ahead and plug in. So first of all, we have before they start shifting around, this is 80 times 3, so 240. Plus then 30 times 1.5, so plus 45. Okay, and then after they shift around. So minus then 80 times 0.4, minus 30 times 1.9, and then all divided by this distance here, which remember was 3.4 meters. And sure enough, the mass M1 is less than M2 at 58 kilograms. There is a second version of this problem, of course, and that would be what happens if M1 was greater than M2. Then in that case, you would find that the canoe shifts to the left 
and you would set up a similar type of situation here algebraically, and you would end up with an answer for M1 that is in fact greater than M2. Notice that I actually didn't need to know where the center of mass was precisely in order to do this problem. But as I described earlier in the example, it always has to be in between M2 and M3 on the diagrams above. So now that we know what M1 is equal to, let's just go ahead and find the position of the center of mass and locate it on the two diagrams. So we'll do this to finish. Okay, so let's make a note here that M1 was 58 kilograms. And now let's jump back up to the top four. It doesn't matter which of the two expressions I use here to find the position of the center of mass because they're both the same. Let me just go ahead and use this expression here. And now let's just go ahead and direct the calculator. Okay, so then to finish here, what I have is first of all 80 times 3, so 240, plus then 30 times 1.5, so plus 45, and then all divided by the following, 58 plus 80 plus 30. And after I calculate this out, this ends up being 1.7 meters, which does make sense because this right here is 1.5 meters. So here's 1.7 meters like so. And then down on this diagram, this was 0.4 and this was 1.9. So 1.7 is like so. Once again, the center of mass is always in between the M2 and M3 in this problem. Okay, okay that concludes this video.